Good morning. Welcome to the final day of the 2021 PLC Legislative Conference. Excuse <clears throat> me. Over the last couple of days, we've uh, had a number of uh, successful meetings. We've been able to visit with uh, legislative representatives from Congress, from the Senate, both new and old uh, officials. Uh, got the perspective of uh, what they're looking at here in the, uh, the upcoming uh, legislature, uh, feel for how things are going. Uh, we've been uh, able to uh, meet with uh, agency personnel from the uh, the federal federal agencies that we all deal with on a regular basis. Got uh, some insight on what they're expecting and anticipating here with the new administration, how things are going to be moving forward. Uh, this morning, we're going to focus on uh, the, uh, uh, in the business of the PLC uh, we're going to have uh, re uh, reports from our uh, different committees and uh, uh, see what we've been, uh, uh, bring everybody up to speed with what we've been doing uh, here over this past year with the, the challenges that we've had with the, uh, the virus, not being able to get together. It's uh, really created a new environment uh, where we're accustomed to being able to meet and face-to-face uh, uh, -face and discuss these different issues and build policies that reflected the needs of, of everybody from California to North Dakota. Uh, it's been a lot a challenge where we haven't been able to do that. We've been utilizing the technology. We uh, do a lot of conference calls, uh, Zoom meetings. Uh, we uh, just a flood of text messages. So uh, we uh, uh, gonna take this opportunity to uh, show everybody where we're at. Uh, how we're coming together, working to, to uh, solve all our problems, the, the issues of the, that we're dealing with today. Uh, we move it along here. Um, we've, uh, uh, as I said, you know, we, we uh, have to find common ground on, uh, on all these different issues uh, between the different states. Uh, when we got the virus hit us and we couldn't get together and meet, uh, we got shut down last spring. We uh, got held off all summer long, had ended up having to cancel the fall meeting. Uh, it was apparent that we, uh, though we had a strong policy uh, book and, and uh, uh, had been working well, we needed to get a system put together to where we could uh, have a more constant flow of information. We were had better contact with the, the states and and what was uh, needed at the time. So we, uh, we redesigned our committee structure. Uh, we, uh, instead of uh, having committees that were tied to or reflecting a, a certain agency, we uh, tried to build them around specific issues. So that uh, which, whether you're dealing with Forest Service or BLM, uh, everything was being discussed at the, at, by the group of people that were being affected by that. Uh, we uh, set it up to where uh, every state has one designated person on every, each committee, and that is going to be the that person is the contact person for to uh, relay issues, keep in touch with uh, the uh, DC office, and uh, uh, make sure that we're always communicating and and uh, working together. Uh, after. The, uh, along with that one person, then we opened it up to where uh, uh, asked for more volunteers to uh, participate on the committees so that we got a broader representation from uh, the people on the ground. That has been very successful. We've had a, a, a really good turnout. A lot of people signed up. Uh, every committee has a good, healthy group of people that to, uh, to come together and work on these issues. So it's going to really uh, improve the situation, we believe. Our uh, committees that we're operating under now are uh, the Grazing Committee, the Wildlife Committee, Multiple Use, and uh, uh, Industry Issues Committee, and the Ecosystem and Environment. A lot of these uh, um, committees, where a lot of the issues cross all boundaries, but as we get into working on a certain issue, uh, we're thinking that we'll be able to have one committee that will probably be the, the uh, spearhead on that issue. And then the, the other committees that are affected by that issue will be able to tie together and, and stay in constant communication. So we make sure that we don't uh, have any loopholes that uh, or have anybody fall through the cracks and, and that we miss something or some people that we need. This morning, we're gonna start out with the uh, grazing committee. 
Um, Matt McGilligan of Oregon and Dan Anderson of South Dakota lead that committee. And uh, Matt and Dan, uh, if the floor is yours, please. All right, good morning, everyone. Oh, I just lost you all. There we go. Are we back? Got you. Okay, thank you. Um, and thank you, Nels. Um, Dan Anderson is on here also. Um, as the, I am the committee chair for the grazing committee. Dan is the vice chair for the, for the committee. We're going to talk a little bit about kind of what we uh, felt we needed to set up. So as Nels said, the committees were set up in different specific areas. Um, and we volunteered for the grazing committee to cover all things grazing. We've had two meetings so far. They've all been Zoom meetings naturally. Um, some people joined on phone, some people joined on the computer. Um, but our very first meeting, we went around through the states and uh, tried to get issues that were affecting those states. And then if those issues also overlapped into other states from Nevada to Oregon to Idaho to Wyoming and so forth. Um, after that call, then we were able to um, dial in about um, three to four key areas that we needed to work on as we felt um, as the committee and our, our committee members and our, um, the people that have volunteered to be on that committee as Nell said, are from all Western states. Um, they're involved in public lands grazing. And we had quite a few people on the phone and quite a few people on the com computer. A couple of things that came to um, the top to work on were permit renewals, um, making sure that everyone knew what really permit renewals were, the steps and processes to go through permit renewals, what worked in some states and some areas and what has not worked in some states and other areas. The other was adaptive management. We need to promote and address adaptive management um, consistent with um, fire risk, fire mitigation, um, tie, tying that in to this uh, administration's thoughts and beliefs that everything is climate related and how we talk that talk and walk that walk and uh, other management opportunities that we have along that line. Um, targeted grazing was one of them and riparian management. So those of us that uh, have permits where there is ESA issues with fish and so forth, we're under a different um, guideline for MIM. Um, and that came up on the call yesterday as we were speaking with the Forest Service with um, the uh, MIMS and riparian management with um, Fish and Wildlife and uh, NOAA Fisheries. So. Those were the main areas um, that we decided that was, that was the avenue where we we're gonna go down. The reason we did that is because as we have all of these states represented and we have about 50 so people on this committee that have volunteered to help, um, we would have 50 different ideas on what was the top priority to go down. And we decided we needed to focus and then kind of, um, take the highlights or the points that affected most everybody and then delve into it from there. Our second meeting, we then um, uh, discussed, again, everybody's needs, took an opportunity again for some of the people that didn't get to talk on the first call to talk, introduce themselves um, and say why they, uh, why they volunteered for the grazing committee, what was their hot issue, um, what would they like to help on. We also then um, set up two subcommittees and one was to deal with grazing um, permit issues, renewal, and Darcy Helmick uh, graciously agreed to lead that subcommittee. And there's been quite a bit of emails, um, traffic going back and forth on that and a, and a good group of people on that subcommittee. And the other is uh, update on the, the grazing directives from the US Forest Service the management directives in the Forest Service Handbook. And Dan um, graciously agreed to lead that group. A lot of the stuff in that handbook revision um, dealt a lot with grasslands, grazing associations. And then I also um, volunteered to help him. So we were working on comments for the up 
some upcoming comment period. So I'll let Dan talk a little bit about that, what they're doing there on their subcommittee. Thanks, Matt. Uh, we've been gathering quite a few comments. Uh, actually, the North Dakota Grazing Association is submitting a 327-page comment uh, deal that uh, our committee will be going through here probably next week. Uh, I'll get that out to everybody. I just received that last night. <clears throat> uh, we've got just a few people on this committee and we need more. I know Matt is one with BLM. Uh, we'd like some other people from BLM. This is something that you folks on BLM will be going through in the future. So uh, I've got comments from two different uh, lawyers uh, uh, that I received one last night. I've got one coming right now. Caitlin has received quite a few comments, uh, but we do need some more people to look at these comments with us. And uh, so we'd appreciate any volunteers. And also Matt, uh, you weren't on the Friday uh, conference call, but the 30 by 30 come up. Uh, I think we've got, uh, you know, every one of our committees is gonna be dealing with something in that 30 by 30 deal. So. I think there's another committee that's gonna take the lead on that. Um, so that's all I have, Matt. Thank you. All right, thank you, Dan. Uh, no, I wasn't on Friday's call, um, but speaking of that 30 by 30, um, and I think yeah, we could look at this current administration and think, well, we're never gonna get anything done. Um, but really we've been doing a lot of what they're already talking about. It's just that we're not talking about it. And as I've said before, is, you know, we need to put it into terms that, that uh, what we do on a daily basis in their terms that the administration understands. And I, and I think we have really good footing there. So excited about the, the uh, opportunity here for the, what we deal with in the grazing committee and what we'll find out, you know, Dan, we're, and, and the people listening here, we're the first committee to talk this morning, but I think you're going to hear a lot of, a lot of common themes. So. Again, our function of our committee, as we believe, is we, we dial in on a few key topics and key issues. And as these committees go forward, as we res resolve one, one issue, um, we'll move on to the next. So uh, Nels, that's our quick update. Um, you know, being that we've only had two meetings and, and our first one and part of our second was really an introductory and get to get to know everybody. We did, um, you know, uh, highlight our top issues and, and that's what we're working towards and that's kind of what we have for this morning um, but we're glad to take um, questions that the audience may have um, about what we're working on or priorities that they think we should be working on Dan also put out an invite for anybody that would like to help us on this management directive uh, we don't have a big group there but it covers all western states uh, so we have somebody from Oregon and several from South Dakota. We'd like some, someone from Nevada, California, Idaho, Washington, and so forth. So any help that you can give us, that would be good because the comments are, are due in, in less than a month. Now I'll turn it back over to you. Thank you for your time this morning. Thank you, Matt and Dan. This is uh, Mark Rover, Vice President of PLC. Uh, Thank you for that update. If anybody does have any questions or wants to contact uh, the committees, uh, if, if you would put it in the chat or raise your hand, uh, we can get to your questions. But they'll get an answer to you. It may not be right now, but if you want to put it in the chat, we'll get answers to you. Uh, next, we'll get an update from the Wildlife Committee. The leadership of the Wildlife Committee, we have Robbie LaValle as chairman, Jordan Willis as vice president, uh, vice chairman. Uh, Robbie, Jordan, if you can go ahead with your update. Good morning, everyone. Uh, Jordan and I are going to uh, tag team this report similar to the grazing committee. First of all, we want to thank everyone who is on the, the Wildlife Committee and um, if anyone that is on the call wants to uh, know who's on their committee from uh, Wyoming, we have Scott Sims, Washington, Warren Hesmeyer. From Utah, of course, is the vice chair, Jordan. From Oregon is John O'Keefe. 
Nevada is Rachel Bazzetti. North, South Dakota is Myron Williams. North Dakota, Gary Anderson. Montana, Skip Algren. Idaho, Jay Smith. And California, Rick. So if anyone uh, want, has an issue particular for wildlife, uh, by all means, you can reach out directly to those individuals or the leadership of the committee, myself or, or Jordan. Or again, as Matt said, we've only met twice. Uh, the wildlife committee is going to concentrate uh, as this affects everyone uh, westwide and beyond, of course, is the, the sage grouse and of course, the legal battles that are still ongoing there as well as the wildlife migration corridors. We did have uh, updates from Wyoming with specific animal damage control issues and uh, worked with that specifically so that there was a greater understanding of the federal agency of animal damage control. Now, of course, that's ongoing as that conversation continues. We did make some progress there, but that'll be an issue that is ever present in as animal damage control moves forward, not only just funding, but just permissions as well. Then the uh, for the uh, action items, then we do have a one pager that is specific to Raven and the Raven impacts that they have not only on our endangered species, but other species as well, and just the increase in Ravens. So Caitlin is putting that together for this group to be able to use uh, again across all of the states for that. So Jordan's going to talk about uh, just our coordination with the other committees and what we have uh, there. Before he does that, specific to the sage grouse, we're working with the Western Governors Association and then um, John O'Keefe was has sent out a WAFA update on the sage grouse and so working through all of that documentation to see where PLC can put their information, their expertise on the ground forward. So now I'll turn it over to Jordan for that coordination portion. Jordan, you're on mute still. There we go. Thanks, Robbie. Um, so as has been said that there's five different committees, so how, how do we coordinate with each other? Because like, like's been said, we only met twice, but there's some overlap in each committee. So we, we each need to focus on the issues and, and how we do that is uh, at the end of the month, um, all of us committees, we, we meet together either on the conference call or, or Zoom. And uh, Caitlin, she's highlighted each committee and uh, the issues going on and we're able to to all stay on the same page or or make sure that we don't have multiple committees working on the same task um, the neat thing with this new structure is the involvement of the states it, it gets a lot of people a lot of different people in each committee involved from each state and uh, sometimes there's there's a person on a committee that has a burning issue and they report, but the nice thing about where we meet at the end of the month, we're able to direct that question or that concern to the specific committee that it maybe has to deal with. So that's how the committees are communicating is uh, in a monthly call or meeting to go over all the issues going on throughout the Western states. Thanks, Back Jordan. To Robbie. Yeah, thank you. And specific to Wildlife Committee, then we're coordinating with the Multiple Use Committee on the wildlife migration. Uh, Bonnie was gracious enough to remind me that animal, I was using an outdated term for animal damage control. It is wildlife services. And thank you, Bonnie, for that. I appreciate that. I'm starting to show my age. So with that, um, is there any questions from the group or any members of the Wildlife Committee? Did I miss anything that you'd like to make sure we put forward? Any suggestions?
Okay, with that, we'll turn it back to you, Mark. Thank you, Robbie. Jordan, thank you. Appreciate the update. Uh, next, like I said, we'll continue. Uh, if you have questions, comments, put them in the chat. We will get answers to you. Uh, next, we'll hear from the Multiple Use Committee uh, leadership. We've got JJ Gokochia and uh, Tim Canterbury is the vice chairman. So, JJ, Tim, you would give us your update. You bet. Thanks. Mark, uh, Tim, Tim's not going to be able to join us this morning. Uh, he apologizes. Uh, he's out trying to make a living like uh, so many of us are right now, busy time of year. I want to thank Nels and, and leadership, uh, number one, for this committee structure. I think this is going to work really, really well. Um, you, you just heard uh, Robbie and Jordan talking about that, too. And, and it is good. You know, we've got input from, from every state uh, in the West right now on this committee. And I think that's crucial. We can't have the same five or six guys talking around, talking about the same issues. Uh, we have got to, <clears throat> excuse me, we've, we've got to expand that. And, and, and this has been a great way to do it. We've also met twice. Um, as you've already heard, you know, 30 by 30 continues to come up. Uh, that's gonna be a big one. We know, I, I'm sure that Dave and Darcy's committee uh, it has been talking about that extensively as well. But at our first meeting, uh, we went through, had some introductions from every state, and then we kind of laid out our top issues right there uh, as far as what we thought multiple use committees should be dealing with. And, and we had land acquisition. Uh, so that's going to be a lot of this land and water conservation fund stuff. We're very concerned about where that money is going to go and, and what that's going to do and what that's going to look like. We see that 30 by 30 initiative coming into that, obviously. Uh, and as a result, we did uh, stand up a working group at our last meeting to address uh, some concerns of that 30 by 30. Uh, it's a small working group within our committee and, and we will be working on policy and, and obviously working with these other committees. I'm sure we'll be working, as I said, with Dave and Darcy, uh, obviously with wildlife and grazing uh, committee, uh, Matt and Dan on that one as well. Uh, land health came up. So we talked a little bit about ecological site descriptions, fire management changes. But at our subsequent meeting, we think that probably goes back over more towards that grazing committee. So we, we kind of pulled away from that at our second one. We're not focusing on it quite as much. And then uh, recreation. Any of you guys that know Tim Canterbury know that, that he's been talking about that and beating that drone for a long time uh, at PLC. And there is a pilot project in Colorado that's gonna start this year and it kind of, that's policing themselves, uh, these recreationists. So we're gonna see how that goes. Uh, Tim is actually uh, going to spearhead a, another working group. This is our second uh, small working group in this committee on that, on recreation, and see if we can't come with some policy, work with our other states, work, uh, states excuse me, work with our national uh, agencies on what we may need to do there. It is a significant issue for us, whether it's uh, road access, fences, gates being left open, uh, gates being torn down. Uh, that water infrastructure is huge. You have people camping on that all the time. And, and when is an area full? When is it too much? And multiple use uh, it no longer is able to occur because one use for, uh, is taking it all, if you will. And that, and that tends to be a lot on the hunting and, and recreation side at certain times of the year. Uh, along with that comes that forging of new roads. And, and again, that kind of goes into trespass. So at our last meeting, we did review. Uh, Caitlin pulled together all of the West's trespass laws that she could get her hands on and what they mean and, and how they work. And it's really interesting to see just how big of a difference we have uh, from state to state. So we will be working on that. Uh, as I said, we talked about a lot about land use planning in general, uh, energy and mining development. We already have some PLC policy on that. I don't think we're going to spend a lot of time in this committee uh, looking at that, but that's obviously something that's going to stay uh, back there uh, behind the scenes as we go forward with this administration. And then the one other big one that, that we were talking about, and I kind of mentioned it at first, was land designations and land acquisition. Uh, at our last meeting, we did uh, pull up all of the wilderness study areas across the West, and, and we took a look state by state at what that acreage looked like. And it is very concerning. And, and one of our big issues is how those are being managed and what we can do uh, to make sure that that just doesn't become more de facto wilderness, if you will. We had some conversations about do we want to push uh, 
some release of some of these wilderness study areas. Either they are wilderness or they're not wilderness. Um, that's obviously kind of a, a, a ticking time bomb and a loaded question. I know Colorado, they have one bill rolled in that took all 600,000 plus acres of wilderness study area and, and, and is bringing it forward now uh, for designation as wilderness. So that, that is obviously concerning. I'm not sure we, we want to go that route, but we are taking a look at that as well uh, in this committee. Um, we uh, meet, I believe it's the third Wednesdays, they're starting to run together uh, every, every month. And, and again, that meeting at the end of the month where all the committee leadership gets together, that's where we kind of hash this out. All right, guys, what did you talk about this month? This is what we talked about. And, and maybe as we continue to go forward, this 30 by 30 working group we have might be pulling in uh, folks from the environmental committee or, or vice versa. We might be shifting over and helping them uh, a little bit more. It, it's still early. Uh, in this new policy structure. I think it's going to work good. I'm very, very excited. And again, I want to thank uh, the leadership for coming up with this and, and a new way to, to kind of skin this cat. And with that, I'll open it up to questions if anybody has any questions uh, for us. And if you want to know, uh, we do have a roster. I don't, I'm not going to go down through the names in the sake of time, but if you want to know who your state point of contact is for that, get a hold of me, get a hold of Caitlin, we can put you in touch with there. And obviously, if you want to participate in that, uh, let us know and we'll make sure you, we get you on that invite list. And we meet uh, at 5.30 Pacific time in the morning. So we're an early committee, guys, so you can still get your coffee in and, and your work done. And Mark, that's it. Okay, thank you, JJ. Um, I didn't see any questions come up in the chat. If you guys do have any for any of the committees, feel free to type them in the in the chat box and, and we'll get those uh, through Caitlin and Allie, we'll get them answered. Um, appreciate your guys' service on these committees. And I, I really like the structure and think this is gonna go well. Um, next, we're gonna hear an update from the Industry Issues Committee leadership with Sean Committee and the floor is yours. Okay, thank you, Brenda. Uh, Sean is tied up and unable to uh, attend the meeting here, so I'm uh, gonna fill in for him. Um, he uh, started the first meeting, got uh, the group together, did the, like everybody, you know, introductions, get a, an idea who, uh, who everybody represents, what the state they're from. As they worked on through there, they started uh, identifying some issues to, to address. This, uh, this committee, um, uh, everybody kind of scratches their head when they see the industry issues. So what does that mean? So it's, uh, it's kind of a catch-all committee. Uh, the, we try to be focused on our main issues with our other committees, make sure we, we were uh, hitting it with a laser beam, not a, not a shotgun blast. This committee uh, will address uh, uh, the other issues that can continue to come up to PLC, but uh, they're not uh, uh, critical issues to everybody, uh, or uh, uh, they're not an issue that we really uh, historically have weighed in on, but uh, most times or quite often we've been asked to, uh, to uh, sign on or give an opinion, things like uh, the uh, immigration, uh, the, uh, the uh, H2A workers, uh, getting into the predator control, um, you know, uh, animal damage issues beyond predators, the, the, with the elk and wild horses, whatever the case may be. So it's kind of a catch-all. So it'll be working with a lot of the other groups, spreading out, uh, uh, you know, and, and coalescing with them and, and uh, be moving forward. Um, on our last call, the... Uh, um, they're still working to kind of identify, uh, uh, focus in on what they really want to put as their priority issues. Uh, the animal damage control uh, was number one. Uh, both uh, the predator control issues uh, uh, from uh, that side, and uh, as I mentioned, the, the uh, uh, game issues that are coming up in a lot of areas, uh, excessive uh, uh, elk populations, things like that, you know, all those types of issues. Uh, death tax was uh, a big one on there, uh, looking at that. And then the, uh, the discussion about infrastructure, what's coming down the pike with uh, this push to uh, do in infrastructure bills. And, and then we got into a little conversation about how, what has it changed around the industry? Uh, for instance, in our area here, we, uh, 
we don't have a lot of the sport in industries, uh, feed stores, uh, things like that, that we used to have around this country. Uh, it's just uh, kind of a catch-all. And then, of course, water, uh, water in the infrastructure was big because of the uh, a lot of the uh, irrigation systems, things like that, are getting old. With it in Wyoming, we've had issues with uh, uh, tunnels collapsing, uh, things um, that way. Uh, at this time, the uh, committee has not set up any uh, working groups uh, uh, because we haven't got it uh, honed down to priority issues yet. We're just continuing to move forward, uh, gathering information and, and fleshing out the issues. Um, Um, we just keep uh, uh, talking about the 3030, uh, like many of the other groups. So um, uh, the bottom line is the uh, committee is getting pulled together and uh, on the way. Uh, we do have representatives on this committee from every state except Arizona. We're still needing to, to get somebody in from Arizona. And uh, as uh, uh, stated before, if there's something in here that, uh, or some issues that are, are uh, burning in your area that you haven't heard discussed somewhere, get a hold of us and let us know that may fit right into this committee and we'd welcome your participation. Uh, with that, any questions, any, uh, anything I can answer? Hey. I guess there's no questions. I'll hand it back to you. Okay, thank you, Nels, for uh, pinch hitting. You did a great job there. Um, there was a question that came up in the chat, Caitlin. Um, I don't know if we want to take it now. Um, it came from, from Dan Anderson about the 3030 and uh, the American Stewards of Liberty. So do you want to go ahead and, and take care of that now, and then we'll move on to the, the next committee? Sure. So uh, Dan, in the chat, Dan, you had asked if uh, on the 30 by 30 proposal, uh, is, is there anything that the group, the American Stewards of Liberty are doing that would be useful to PLC? Uh, and if so, can we work with them? Um, the last thing that I saw from the American Stewards of Liberty uh, was their discussion on private property rights. Uh, and they were having a, a discussion, I think at the end of last week, uh, about uh, mobilizing Nebraska producers uh, who were who private landowners, um, mobilizing them to fight this 30 by 30. Um, over the last, and a lot of these conversations have been prompted by other lands groups that aren't necessarily uh, public lands groups, uh, that they're, they're more private landowners based uh, and, and their, their landowner uh, alliance type discussions. Um, but, you know, I, I think there are some common tenets uh, across a lot of the efforts that these groups uh, are, are going to be are, are going to be talking about. Uh, the, the, the question that 30 by 30 in general, it needs to count what's already been designated in that preservation category uh, that the, the government says, uh, look, you know, we've, we've designated, we have, have made an effort to preserve on public lands, uh, the, these monuments, these wilderness, those are, are preservation categories, and those should count first. There's a second bucket of all of the things that are voluntary conservation that do have a federal nexus through one federal program or another. And then there's this third bucket of, of all of the other things that private landowners do, that, that public land stewards do, uh, that you do in cooperation with uh, groups that are, are, are not the government, uh, or that you do on your own land of your own volition. And that's that third category uh, of things where we really do need to see uh, some, some fairly significant recognition uh, from this administration about all of the good things that are done. And so, you know, to that end, um, yeah, I, I think that there are, there are going to be opportunities for us to work with a, a variety of groups uh, across the board. Uh, our tone uh, and, and the approach that PLC has taken so far has been very uh, engaging and, and supportive and constructive. 
Um, I don't know, you know, what, what sort of conversations this particular group has had, uh, but that's something where I can spend some time over the next while uh, talking and, and talking with them, talking with their leadership, and really understanding what their, uh, what their approach is for this proposal. I, I think our priority is going to continue to be to work with folks who are, are constructive, who are finding that middle ground, who are going to, uh, you know, there's certainly there are hard line issues and there, there are uh, distinct issues, uh, but we do, you know, the, the, the approach and that we continue to take is that diverse coalition uh, to achieve the ends that we would like to see. Dan, I know that you are, uh, doesn't look like you're, you're still uh, uh, a panelist here or, or uh, have been elevated, but is, did that answer your question? Would you like to provide a little bit more context uh, there for, for what they're doing? Uh, yes, Caitlin, I, I haven't studied them real close. I just received a letter yesterday from them uh, on that issue in, so that's the reason that prompted me to ask the question, just to make sure that uh, we're watching what other groups are doing and if, if there's anything that's beneficial there. And, and I agree with you, we, we are doing a lot of work uh, on our own property that should qualify. And there are some of these laws or acts, especially at Bankhead Jones, was created to conserve these lands so you know i think they're already being conserved if we can get that point across thank you caitlin I think you're right, and, and and you know all of this sort of goes back to this general discussion about preservation and conservation, and then in conservation, what does that threshold look like? Does conservation mean, uh, and and you know not to be too cute about it, but does conservation mean that you have to be enrolled in a USDA conservation program that's part of the conservation title in the Farm Bill? Uh, certainly, we would argue no. That is not the policy of the government. That is not the policy of producers. It's certainly not the policy of our association <clears throat> or or any other organization. And, and so, you know, defining what that threshold is and, and making sure that uh, that 30 by 30 is as inclusive and as constructive as it can be, um, that, that will continue to be a priority. So that's a great suggestion, Dan, and, and uh, I will spend some more time um, figuring out what, what those parameters look like. Uh, in addition, uh, as, as JJ uh, and, and uh, as um, and uh, as others have mentioned, you know, we, we are going to have this 30 by 30 subcommittee. And so for those of you who have uh, a nexus with these other groups who are working on, um, who are working on 30 by 30 uh, engagement uh, approaches themselves, uh, please feel free. Uh, we would encourage you to participate in this 30 by 30 subcommittee. Uh, and, and share those perspectives and, and share that feedback uh, with us as well as part of that subcommittee. Okay. Thank you, Caitlin, and thank you, Dan, for that uh, question. Um, I think that that's something as all of the committees have stated that we're gonna need to keep on track with and, and appreciate the discussion. So um, next, we're gonna get an update from the Ecosystem and Environment committee leadership. Um, the leaders of this committee are Dave Daly and Darcy Helmick. And I don't see Dave on today. I do see Darcy. So Darcy, the floor is yours. Good morning. Can everyone hear me okay? All right. I'm, I'm hoping so. Um, so Dave was unable to join us this morning and he asked me to provide an update on what we've been working on in the Ecosystems and Environment Committee. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Darcy Helmick, and I serve as Idaho's board member for PLC. It's uh, been great and interesting week, and I think the biggest takeaway from listening to all the presentations, not just throughout the week, but this morning, um, is that there's going to be a huge focus on climate and environment with this administration. Um, it's always nice going last because I could probably pretty much say what everyone else said, that's what we're working on. But this committee structure really gives us the opportunity to work on the same issues but in a different manner and then collaborate where we need to. So specifically, um, I just wanted to follow up on just like Matt said initially with the grazing committee, 
Um, you know, all of us have been striving towards achieving and maintaining healthy ecosystems within our operations. And I don't think we've ever thought of it in terms that are being utilized today, or the fact that livestock grazing is actually an ecosystem service. As a group, we know what an important role our livestock play in functional ecosystems, and there has never been a time like the present to showcase that. In my mind, we really have at least four avenues our committee can serve. One, define the issues with existing policies and or new policies and provide Caitlin and the rest of the PLC crew the help they need to lobby on our behalf regarding the changes needed. Two, provide Caitlin and her crew on the ground examples of flaws of existing policies to help influence change where needed. Three, serve on and advise leaders serving on other committees, including but not limited to things like the US Roundtable of Sustainable Beef. And lastly, four, membership guidance and help. The best way to learn is from each other. Um, and what do we do as individuals and have experience in that can help our other members? We as a group have spent our last couple of meetings really brainstorming and discussing issues that have been around for decades and trying to determine how they are best placed within the current political climate. First of all, fire. I'd be willing to bet if we pulled up original documents from PLC issues, fire, fire would be on that list. It is a occurrence that managers have dealt with for many years in many ways, both as a tool for healthy ecosystems and also as a nemesis when occurrences have been catastrophic and damaging. One of our committee's key focus is fire. There are multiple avenues we wish to pursue to identify the right place for fire within the ecosystem conversation. While we plan to tackle many aspects of fire, some of the things we discussed are fuels treatments, including prescribed fire, rancher and permittee access during a fire, rancher liaison programs, and rangeland fire protection associations, or RFPAs. California has an initiative out right now that's pretty impressive regarding fire, and we're taking a closer look at it. In addition, we discussed putting together a how-to pamphlet for ranchers who would like to start up RFPAs within their states. This will include a discussion on legislation each state has in order for these organizations to function. We have some real experts within PLC that have been instrumental in RFPAs within different states that can be tapped into for this project. We will be doing outreach to see if there's an interest in that kind of document. An interesting note here is initially when Idaho uh, created RFPAs, the feedback that we got was uh, very supportive nationally. I think for at least four years following the creation of our RFPAs, every time we met with folks in DC, that's all they wanted to talk about. Um, having something positive to focus on going into conversations is one of the things that Caitlin highlighted yesterday. I think it's really important for creating relationships. I wish I would have kept tally on the times I've heard 30 by 30 um, throughout the week, even just this morning. Uh, kind of like counting cows, I lose track if I don't write it down, but I can tell you that we have heard it a lot. Um, as I noted earlier, all of the other groups have mentioned 30 by 30, and we are looking forward to working with those um, other committees in the subcommittee on 30 by 30 to ensure that livestock grazing is not negatively impacted by the 30 by 30 goals um, and, lever and is leveraged as a positive instead. We've had brief conversation about carbon sequestration and emissions, and I found the presentations on Monday afternoon to be extremely interesting in this realm. A lot of entities are focusing on their carbon footprint, and there is no doubt as food producers, at some point in time, we are going to be asked to provide our carbon footprint to those purchasing our product. The question remains, how do we know? Uh, this is an area where the committee is interested in gaining knowledge and staying engaged as models are developed. We recognize that partnerships are critical. The message was clear yesterday. Every agency that spoke indicated their gratefulness for the relationships we have with PLC. These positive relationships go outside agency doors to many other groups, some of which are unlikely partners. We know it is critical to keep the door open and there are several coalition PLC is already engaged in. 
At each of our meetings, Caitlin is providing us with a summary of just one of the coalitions, so we have a good idea who they are and how we fit in. We started with the National Grazing Lands Coalition, uh, which currently has two seats available. If there is a specific need at one of the coalitions, it is our goal to be educated and engaged in a way that we can support Caitlin and other members representing grazing at these coalitions. One project that we have taken on is the need to clarify terms commonly used regarding livestock grazing within this ecosystem and sustainability world. A worksheet has been developed to identify how we feel about some of these words. Uh, this E and E terms to reconcile has been emailed out and needs to be back to Caitlin by April 14th so we can continue on that project. We are excited to continue to move toward to move forward with the work on this committee. We are still missing representatives from Arizona and South Dakota. So if you are from one of those states or know someone who is, please point them in our direction. I know our name is scary, but we really are a fun group. So with that, um, does anyone have any questions? I'm uh, not hearing any questions. I will turn it back over. Uh, Darcy, we do have a couple of questions there in the, the chat. Um, okay, no, I'm not seeing them on my end. Could you please read them for me? Oh. Well, that was already answered. There was, I saw one that disappeared that was uh, asking for a definition of the, um, uh, uh, it'd be your, your uh, fire group, the RF. Uh, sure. I don't even know. I know who you are, but I don't <laughs> know what you call it. <laughs> and this is a little bit of a pet peeve of mine, actually. So I'm glad the question came up. Um, the question would be, what is an RFPA? What does the acronym stand for? And what it actually stands for is Rangeland Fire Protection Association. So what's really critically important about that acronym is we're a nonprofit organization. We are in no way a taxing entity. We don't compete for taxing tax dollars within uh, the, the county. And that has been sort of a source of contention um, until it's clarified. So thank you for that question. Okay. Any other questions? Okay, thank you, Darcy. Uh, we've uh, been able to move through our schedule pretty uh, quickly today. We kind of anticipated a little more uh, more questions and discussion. Uh, so we have some time available. Uh, we've got a number of the state execs and state leadership on signed on today. I'll uh, uh, throw this open to uh, open forum for a period of time here. Uh, anybody wants to uh, uh, step up and tell us what's going on in their their home states or make any kind of a report you'd like to open open forum. It's up to you. Miss Bonnie, I see that you've been elevated. Uh, What's going on in, in Colorado uh, with, with the, all of the sheep industry? There you go, you're unmuted now. We might have to come back to, to Bonnie. Um, okay, I'm, oh, I'm back. Are. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, you know, I, um, I, I really don't have room to complain about big predators because some of the other states have been dealing with this for decades. We've been really fortunate um, to dodge the bullet on the wolf for so long, but um, the ballot initiative did pass in November to forcibly release wolves in Colorado um, by our state game agency, which they're not thrilled about either, but it was a mandate through a ballot initiative. So um, 
that says that we have to have released wolves on the ground by December 2023, even though we already have um, migrating wolves coming in from Wyoming. So we're starting to develop um, that that working plan. And very unfortunately, I mean, we'll be able to rely on the expertise from the other states because of all the the hardship that they've had. So we'll be looking to, you know, Idaho, uh, Wyoming, and Montana for some help there. Um, many of you may um, also be aware that there was a, a title filed uh, initiative 16 for a 2022 ballot initiative. It's uh, called the PAWS Act that's um, centering around supposed animal cruelty, but what it would do is make illegal um, Literally, I mean, I can't even believe I have to say this, but literally you'd be um, prosecuted as a sex offender if you're doing any reproductive services with animals. Um, the other really damaging part of this is that it says that um, animals cannot be slaughtered until they've lived out one quarter of their natural lifespan. And so um, right now the <clears throat> Cattlemen Farm Bureau wool growers uh, Colorado Livestock Association, pork, and um, dairy. Um, we did just uh, form a coalition, Coloradans for uh, Animal Care. We did a press release on that yesterday. We will fight this at the title board. Um, unfortunately, Colorado has one of the most liberal um, ballot initiative processes in the United States. And I mean, kind of the standing joke is um, if you wanted to introduce unicorns in Colorado, you could do it through the initiative process because um, it's built to put things before the voters. It doesn't matter whether they're rational or not. That comes after something passes, then you can litigate it. Um, but we will challenge this at the title board under the single subject um, ruling, and then also um, possible Supreme Court challenge or Colorado Supreme Court challenge on it to try to shut it down this spring. But most most likely, we are going to see this go um, to the ballot in 2022. Um, and so, you know, this is this is going to reverberate throughout the United States if this passes. So we'll be working hard to get that shut down. And then the last thing I'd mention is at the Colorado State Capitol, um, Senate Bill 87 is an Ag Worker Bill of Rights. And, you know, th that sounds wonderful. Who doesn't want workers to be treated fairly? But this is really pushed by radical activist groups. It's not just H-2A workers, it's any workers across the board on regarding um, overtime payment, um, a lot of um, detailed things, housing requirements, um, breaks that should go through a rulemaking process with the Department of Labor. It should never be um, cemented in statute. So um, that's going to be, again, really damaging to agriculture if that passes. So um, about the, the same groups that I just previously mentioned with the Cattlemen and the Farm Bureau, um, we're all fighting that at the state legislature right now. So um, that's about as much happy news as I have from Colorado right now. Always happy news coming from Colorado, Bonnie. Uh, thank you for uh, sharing with us. Uh, and obviously we'll be working to support you uh, and Colorado PLC and Colorado Cattlemen uh, as, as you go through some of these uh, initiatives as well. Um, the ballot initiative process is, is a, a wonder of democracy, um, but it is, is not always um, the most judicious or the most accurate way uh, to, to reflect current issues. Right. We're, we're going to have to start developing some of those memes that says, hold my beer when, when we're talking about Colorado. So we need this, the support of our friends. Thank you. <laughs> uh, thanks. Thanks. Appreciate that. Mr. President, it looks like we have um, some of our Idaho contingent on. Cameron and Karen are both on. Um, would one of you, I, I know that there were some connectivity issues this morning, um, would one of you mind providing an update to, from the, the great state of Idaho? Uh, yeah, Caitlin, this is Cameron. I was just wondering. Can you see my video? My computer's uh, 
not wanting to zoom properly, so I'm on my phone. Um, <clears throat> I wanted to just give a little update. Yesterday, we talked some about the the two year off on fire. Um, we had a fire burn through here called the Woodhead Fire, and with the permittees and the BLM, we went in and, and worked out a deal that's going to allow them to go on early. Uh, uh, well, at their normal time, but in the early grazing season and go on at full, full numbers um, and then use soil temperature and other triggers uh, and the BLM is going to give them a, a notice of when they have to come off. So if that's a successful program and we can establish the seedings in the fall, that could be a good precedence for many folks around the West and here in Idaho. Uh, those permittees aren't going to go on till just, uh, I think one goes on the 15th of April and a couple others go on the 1st. So th it's coming right up. Um, and it was encouraging to have our BLM folks use the flexibility that's allowed to them and work with the permittees and, and you know, try to get them back on there. And hopefully it will also, we can show it didn't impact the seating. And hopefully that'll be something good in the long run that, that we can all utilize. Um, the other thing that was mentioned yesterday was related to stock water rights. Uh, I know Terry Padilla mentioned that in Idaho and that's something we've been working on here um, at various levels. The way it's set up right now, um, a permittee can file on their own stock water rights. They can also sign an agreement saying they are limited agents of the BLM, which would allow them to maintain the stock water right in the name of the BLM, or there's some that have both names on them. But uh, it is an ongoing thing that we deal with every legislative session, and that's following the Joyce Livestock decision uh, that, that became finalized. And this all started in 2017 is when our legislature uh, moved forward with that. So um, with that, I'll defer to Karen if she has anything else to add, but those are just two things that were mentioned yesterday um, and came to mind today to, to mention. Um, not the only other thing would be wolves, but uh, that's a big conversation. So I won't take up a lot of time on, on wolves today. And we can talk more about that specifically with the folks that are involved in that, that process, either in Colorado, Wyoming, uh, Montana, Oregon, Washington, um, it's not a limited number of states that have them. Even Nevada has seen some wolves, but from what we've heard from our industry or our fish and game folks, I guess, is that uh, those are Oregon wolves that went to Nevada. Our Idaho wolves don't cross I-84 and go south. So um, fortunately, we can't be held accountable for the Nevada wolves, but the Oregon and Washington wolves uh, seem to have drifted over from Idaho and established residency there. Well, I'm sure they appreciate your sharing, Cameron. <laughs> sharing is caring. Okay, thank you, Cameron. Uh, we've been uh, looking at having some people uh, wave to get on, but we're having some technical problems. So uh, um, I would uh, jump to uh, Matt uh, right now. You've uh, got some issues here. I think we're just waiting to unmute. Okay. Then we will follow the uh, map uh, call on Sky. All right. Good morning, everyone, again. Uh, my issues are with Cameron and Nils um, because Oregon <laughs> up <in> Idaho. <laughs> uh, so uh, so you, you can't get out of that one, Cameron. Um, yeah, wolves are, are, are always an issue here in Oregon. And we have uh, oh, packs everywhere from the California-Oregon border um, to the uh, Washington and Idaho-Oregon border. Um, so they're all over the place. We're quite used to wolves. So Bonnie, if you need some help, um, we are well versed in it. Just give us a holler out here. Uh, on the Oregon, just a real quick Oregon update. Um, Kind of what we've been going through here this past year uh, has, has been in the news constantly for years. 
is um, the uh, Hammond Ranches incorporated their permit outside of Burns, Oregon. Um, I'm, I'm sure everyone on this call is quite familiar with that. Just a real quick update. Um, we remiss not to mention that is that in the end of the year, they were um, awarded their permit back through a long exhaustive process that the BLM went through. Um, I read the decision and, and it was at that point I felt was, was a very good decision and all the steps that they went through to do that. Um, one of the environment or a couple of the environmental groups protested that because it was awarded back to them before the comment period was supposed to close, just by days, actually. Uh, even though those same groups put in comments and there was over a hundred comments given on that. So, so we're working through that. And then because of that, the current administration rescinded that decision and removed that permit from. So um, OCA, Oregon Cattlemen's Association and our PLC, have been working on that and working to get that um, decision handed out, you know, one way or the other, no matter who's permitted is um, the steps that they went through just yanking like that. Um, uh, we are working through the, uh, um, like the policy and the laws that they followed to do that. And uh, quite frankly, a lot of it is political. That's my opinion. My opinion doesn't count but that's really what's happening. So that's a quick update on there. We're also working with OSU, as I stated, I think yesterday on some off-season grazing to control uh, Medusa head cheatgrass. And uh, we're talking about um, another invasive annual grass called Ventanata. And I don't know if very many of you other states have Ventanata, but you don't want it. Um, it's, it's quite invasive, spreads fast. Cattle don't like it, wildlife don't like it, and it sure takes over um, your grazing ground pretty fast. Uh, other things that we're working on in, you know, in our state is first and foremost, we're, we are planning on having a mid-year meeting on the coast of Oregon, which will be a live meeting as long as the state doesn't shut us down, but we're slowly, Oregon is reopening and we hope by July then uh, we will have our mid-year meeting. So I would invite everyone from Oregon that's listening, uh, please sign up for that. Uh, I think we're going to have big, big attendance because everybody wants to get out, visit with their neighbors and visit with their colleagues. Uh, and it'll be on the coast of Oregon, which will be very unique for a grazing, you know, cattle meeting. We do have a lot of cattle producers on the West Coast that aren't public lands users, but they are members of OCA and so we do try to have our meetings throughout the state. Um, that's kind of what's the big stuff that's happening in Oregon. Uh, again, we're still working on our Blue Mountain Forest Plan, which encases five and a half million acres of forest land. Uh, it's a long drawn out process. And as the Forest Service people said yesterday, they don't know when it's gonna be completed. Um, and right now it's only an agency to agency meeting. And we from PLC and OCA are getting called in um, for expert testimony only every now and again. So I'm a little antsy on what the finished product is going to look like because that, uh, that affects um, a, a big portion of Eastern Oregon and a lot of our public lands grazers. So that is an update from Oregon, Nels. Nels, you're muted. Uh, thank you, Matt. Uh, Sky, looks like you're unmuted and ready to go. You're better prepared than I am. Well, thank you, Nels. I really don't have much to add. Matt covered pretty much all the uh, state issues, and uh, I'm on the verge of service anyway, so I'll just yield my time to someone with better, better internet. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Scott. Uh, looks like uh, Vance Broadbent uh, got the floor if you want. Good morning. Can you hear me okay? Yeah. 
Okay, so yes, I'm Vance Broadbent uh, from Wyoming. I'm the past president of uh, U Wyoming Wool Growers, also involved with the stock growers. Uh, appreciate the opportunity to, to participate today and uh, appreciate all that PLC uh, does for us out west. Um, just a, a brief update, um, both stock growers and wool growers have been uh, monitoring legislative issues here in Wyoming while that's been going on, uh, trying to keep producers aware of what's going on there. Um, like several of the other Western states, uh, we're kind of going, we've been in a drought and we're kind of going in this grazing season in a drought. Uh, hopefully we get some spring rains to make up for the, the tough conditions we've had this winter. Um, in uh, one of our issues here in Southwest Wyoming, we've been dealing with <clears throat> uh, aerial predator control on BLM grounds uh, from non-wildlife service agencies. We've been, been working through that, spent a lot of time on that. Um, we're, like, like has been mentioned before, the 30 by 30, uh, that's been a concern and uh, been discussing that. Also in Uinta County in the Southwest corner of the state, we've been working with our county commissioners, kind of bring them up to speed, um, help them to be aware of the effects of this on our county and the economic impacts that it could have. So um, I, I think that's about it off the top of my head uh, with the short notice, but uh, do appreciate um, all that you do uh, for PLC, from PLC for us Western producers. Thank you, Vance. Okay, uh, Caitlin, do you have anybody else? I don't see anybody on my list. I don't have anybody else. Is there any other state that we missed? State executive, state leadership? Let's see, oh, we have a raised hand. Oh, Sam, yes, you were at the, the bottom of my screen here. Uh, Sam, we are going to let you unmute. Please do provide us an update from uh, Washington State. Just have to unmute there. I think that, there you go. Am I on? Gotcha. Okay. Uh, I couldn't get Ashley on this morning. She's uh, having some, blowed her knee out. So different doctor's appointments. So maybe she's off to the doctor this morning. Anyway, uh, as we talked yesterday, I guess our big issue is our lawsuits that are going on. Uh, we visited with the Forest Service a little bit yesterday, and I, I hope we get some traction from that, uh, Caitlin. But uh, okay, uh, I even got video now. Um, I guess what disappointed me is that that uh, nationally it didn't appear like the upper reaches of the Forest Service were aware of the lawsuits. And uh, as we have talked in the past, these these lawsuits could affect grazing in the in all of the West. So that's uh, we're not only defending grazing in Washington on Forest Service ground, but I believe we're defending grazing as a whole on public ground in the West, anywhere. So uh, wide implications in these lawsuits. Uh, it's not easy to, to get involved in a lawsuit. None of us like that. None of us want that. But uh, along with PLC's help and uh, uh, Worston Farm Bureau's help and uh, Western legal help with Carolyn Deffrey working hard to defend grazing. So, for those of you that aren't aware of that, uh, le uh, environmental groups, three different environmental groups, have sued the Colville. 
forest for uh, for grazing, the suitability of grazing in the Colville forest. So we feel like if that is if that prevails, then uh, it has wide implications across the West. So that is that is our our big thing. There's there's always issues. We've had several fires across the state last year, as many of you have. Uh, so keeping them people on the ground or giving them opportunities to to stay on the ground to, to care for their keep their livestock and their and their ranches intact is is a big issue. Uh, working with possibly yesterday we talked to to U.S. and Fish and Wildlife and and working with any anyone. Uh, I have a meeting with Washington State Fish and Wildlife. Working with anyone that we can possibly come up with grazing to to mitigate these uh, lost grazing by fires and, and uh, it was encouraging to hear Cameron mention that get back out there before the two-year mandatory thing you know in the past the school fire in 2005 I was able to meet with a regional forest service grass specialist on the ground and uh, at that time they felt like there were no damage to grass and that uh, the producer was able to go out after only one year rest so I'd encourage people that if you have these situations that if you can get some grazing experts through NRCS or or, or whatever to to look at the ground and make recommendations and and like Cameron said just you know, form a plan and, and monitor it and, and work with it to keep our producers in business. Is a great resource to help us get that done. Uh, as everybody else has mentioned, wolves are a big issue in the state. Uh, we have the, that is actually one of the, had state come in and do depredations on wolves in that area. So, I guess that's about it. Uh, all the the uh, state legislation in Washington is also working on the ag over time thing. So that would be a big, big. Uh, Harm. They actually, uh, at one point, and probably still are trying to make it retroactive for three years. So that would just be devastating to to ag in our state. So I hope no, none of your other states are having to deal with that. That's a a big battle that we're working through with our lobbyist uh, Mark Struley and and uh, a lot of a lot of Democratic power in. The, in our legis in our state legislator right now that was pushing for that and it would just be devastating for for all of ag so again the uh, washington farm bureau was big working with them on that so, okay. anyway thank you sam it looks like we've got a question from cameron for you uh cameron you want to jump on yeah i hope you can hear me i've trying to get my video to start up. I finally got my computer to attach properly. So a little better view than the lights above me. Um, I just wanted to kind of let everybody know what, what we did when we went into that meeting with the BLM following the Woodhead fire. Um, three of those permittees, there, there were four involved. Uh, three of them came to the office beforehand and, and we went in there with a proactive game plan. Um, when we walked into the room, they were getting cut uh, to 19% because that was the amount of forage they felt was available. And we kind of prepped beforehand with um, a study they'd done at the University of Idaho related to germination of cheatgrass versus perennial grasses with uh, soil temperature. Um, we went in there prepared with um, how hoof action can incorporate that seed the seed actually went on this fall um, and our permittees knew when it went on. 
And, and we went in there and we didn't even let them, the folks at that BLM office get started with what they wanted to do. Uh, we went in there proactive and we said, this is what we are gonna do to help you establish your perennial seeding. And, and went with the hoof action, uh, reducing annual grasses um, that are prevalent up there. And even though they didn't ever ask us to completely show them, we backed it up with their, you know, we have a University of Idaho study that shows cheatgrass, don't quote me on the numbers, germinates at six degrees cooler soil temperature then do your perennial grasses. Um, and then we worked out a date of when they would start that monitoring. So they agreed the first 30 days, everybody could go on full amount, um, full numbers. And then at 30 days, they would start that monitoring. There had to be some work with the permittees to, to go ahead and uh, make sure that they could get the cattle off when the BLM determined that the germination of their seedings was at a point they needed cattle off of there. Um, luckily in that range, our permittees felt like in a three day period, they could have everything gathered pretty easily. Um, but the thing that I really want to plot at our permittees, but also the BLM on that is we went in there with a plan and the BLM, that particular uh, field office, they just listened to the plan and then went with what they could do within their, you know, current purview. So I'm really hopeful that we can make that work because like I say, it will be a, a huge precedence for everybody around the West. Um, because even though tiers is recommended, I think we only have one field office in the state where it's actually a set hard number. Um, the rest of it's just more of a, a recommendation that everybody's always used, but hopefully this will be beneficial and, and that proactive approach I think really helped us or else these guys would have been cut by 81% on that allotment this year. Thank you, Cameron. It's interesting to pull information. And thank you, Sam. I'm gonna go on to uh, John uh, Griggs night right now from Nevada. And when he's got done, uh, we'll move on to the last section of our scheduled program. Floor is yours, John. You're on mute. How about now? Now we got you. Oh. <laughs> Sorry for that. <clears throat> Sorry for that. So John Griggs, president elect Nevada Cattlemen's Association. Appreciate you having me on and uh, we really appreciate all you folks do for us. Uh, a couple things at the national level, outcome-based grazing demonstration, our biggest ranch involved and maybe the biggest project of it all is the Wine Cup Gamble Ranch in Northeast corner of Nevada. That project's been sued by Western Watersheds and uh, BLM appeals judge um, granted them a stay, which kind of puts that project on hold. Interesting that uh, I've been a little bit involved with that project. The ranch manager there put together a really big uh, committee of, of across agencies, um, academia, other ranchers, NGOs, really big, really big uh, committee to write that um, demo project. It's, it's hard to imagine that they have much of a leg to stand on as far as, as what that project will do for the, for the resource. I, I'm sure it's a, like, well, like they do, I'm sure it's a, it's a um, challenge over procedure, not, not what's potentially going to happen on the ground, but Anyways, we're kind of waiting with bated breath to see what happens there. <clears throat> As an association though, mostly we're probably focused on our legislative session, which is biennial and is happening right now. Las Vegas, Nevada, 
outnumbers the rest of the state, Reno area included something like four or five people to one person. So <clears throat> we're all kind of uh, in the back of the bus waiting to see where they steer us. It's, it's uh, maybe not quite as painful as what, what you folks in Colorado are experiencing, but still, uh, still a wild ride. Um, our, our legislative session is time limited, so we get a lot of uh, let's hurry up and pass this bill so we can see what's in it kind of attitudes and it, and it makes it pretty difficult. We're always in Nevada fighting about water since it's the most precious and, and, and uh, most valuable resource we have. So there's some water bills that we're, that we're kibitzing on. Uh, our, <clears throat> our own Nevada Department of Agriculture is, is uh, trying to adjust the Board of Agriculture so that potentially cattlemen don't have a seat on it anymore, which is obviously pretty scary. We're uh, dealing with, with trespass issues. Nevada's trespass laws are, are not very workable for private property owners and that uh, they can be gained pretty hard for the trespassee and uh, other rural legislators are, are trying to make it worse, not better. So we're dealing with that and Really, other than all the challenges you folks are working on, that's about it from Nevada. Again, appreciate you and thanks for having me on. Thank you, John. Uh, I want to thank everybody for the, joining in here, participating. I'm going to reach over to Bob Skinner now and uh, for to uh, complete the last section of the program. Bob, floor is yours. Thank you, Nels. Can you hear me? Is my uh, microphone okay? That's good. Good, perfect. Well, it's been quite a session for the last couple of days, and uh, I think the uh, office staff and uh, and Nels and Mark and everybody are sure recommended. Brenda, everybody, it's uh, it's been a long long time, and we've worked pretty hard on this. Anyway, uh, as, as the immediate past president uh, of PLC, one of the things I know is of most uh, benefit to public lands ranchers are the grants that our uh, endowment funds are bringing forward. And uh, I know last year was pretty short on that because of the economy, but um, PLC gives to further science policy and develop tools for ranchers nationwide. In the coming weeks, PLC Board of Directors will be meeting to consider the folks for grant applicants to answer for the upcoming year. We've kind of restructured things a little bit. Sky, uh, we're trying to run this thing more as a business now. We're handling so much money that um, we realized that we just had to change our structure. We were going there to uh, listen to us about took up the whole day. And um, anyway, we are going to restructure that. And that's up to the board of directors. And that's upcoming. Um, the project is fund in the past have varied widely from work on sage grouse to litigation, communications uh, across the whole board, uh, if it was a value to our industry. The upcoming year is another opportunity to answer questions lands ranchers. This year, we'd like to gather suggestions from all of you about what you'd like to see PLC investigate this year. Some suggestions have been carbon storage in range plants, grazing impact on range post fire, and success of certain stewardship practices. And that's just the beginning. So anybody that uh, has any more burning uh, uh, ideas, uh, please get them into staff. Um, let's see, put, uh, any, anybody has any ideas, you can also put them into chat right now and uh, we're watching. So I wanna just say that uh, during my time with BLC, uh, the project that I feel had the most value for our grazers across the West um, 
is that for me it was Western Resource Legal Center, and I know that varies from person to person to person as to what they think is the most valuable, but for me that has just been a real game changer. Um, Western Resource Legal Center uh, has been in defense of our industry. They are on the front line of this. They, uh, they are stationed in the hot spot in Oregon. Oregon itself is a pretty good hot spot. And uh, at, at Lewis and Clark University, Lewis and Clark was the undisputed king of environmental law. And we, uh, we took that right to them and are, we're situated there in a very good stance now included in the curriculum at, uh, at uh, Lewis and Clark. So anyway, I think that's been a, a big chain game changer. And uh, I know for me, uh, it's been a real pleasure to see what that uh, organization has done for PLC. And I think uh, Caroline Lobdell uh, the last I knew, which wasn't very long ago, she has never lost a case in her life. Uh, that's a, quite a statement to make. So anyway, uh, with that, I'd like to ask uh, the rest of the executive committee that's on right now for their feedback while attendees ideas are shared in the chat. So would the rest of the executive committee weigh in on what you think uh, we might do with this and then We'll take some uh, some ideas from chat too. So go ahead. So Bob, this is this is Brenda, and I uh, I think that you hit it right on the head. WRLC has been one of our our most uh, uh, successful investments with with the funds for getting those students trained up and. Um, you know, as we always remind everybody, we can't use that for litigation, but we sure can use it to get the, the attorneys of the future educated on the benefits of public lands grazing and the community aspect and uh, just natural resources in general. And nobody does a better job than Caroline. So I would agree with you on that, Bob. I'd also like to say, having been on this, um, from the get-go, it's really exciting to see how we've been able to evolve and have good conversations uh, with our PLC board of directors and the trust protectors and the people that are putting projects forward. And we were asked if there was, you know, one project that jumps out. And uh, like Bob said, WRLC is there. We've had a, a communications project that we got some success out of um, and it got us down the right road uh, for discussions on where we really wanted to head. So there's been some really good things that have come out of out of trust projects, the sage grouse research. Um, but the one thing that I, I really would like to say is we need input from the board of directors because in my time uh, working with the trust projects, we've developed a better way of working through the presentations of sending out um, our request for proposals. And that's been, um, that's been one of the highlights is seeing how this has been able to progress and how we've been able to bring people in. So I would encourage all of you, uh, we've had a lot of conversation about 3030. There's a lot of things going forward, but really put some thought into um, the question that Bob just asked and make sure we're headed in the right direction because every, every proposal that we've heard over the years, we have been able to learn something from, even if we did not fund that proposal, we have been able to take information, develop partnerships and work forward. So uh, I would just uh, like to commend the trust protectors and uh, the officers and the board of directors and our PLC members for that. And with that, I'll turn it back over to another member of the executive committee. Yeah, this is Mark. Um, <clears throat> I just echo a lot of, of what uh, the previous two executive committee members spoke on. I think WRLC has been probably at the forefront of, of uh, our grant proposals as worthwhile causes. But <clears throat> like uh, Brenda said, you know, we've had, we've learned something from just about every one of them. Uh, we've narrowed it down a little bit because it, uh, you know, whenever you have money, uh, it kind of felt like 
we were getting a lot of ass to uh, bankroll a lot of a lot of things that uh, maybe weren't all in the process of the overall good of the industry, but just projects. So that's why it's narrowed down, been narrowed down a little bit. I think we've got a lot of potential here uh, of things that can help us coming up this year, and uh, hopefully we can get some. RFPs out that uh, kind of fill those roles, but carbon sequestration, uh, a lot of this to do with climate, the 3030, uh, you can go on and on and on. So I just echo what Bob had said and uh, put a little thought into it and give this, put the suggestions into staff and we'll go forward. So I'll turn it over to Nels. Hey, thank you, Mark. Am I on? Yep. Okay. Thanks, Mark and, and uh, Bob, Brenda. Appreciate everything. Um, I uh, certainly wouldn't argue with anything that was uh, said on the uh, um, where our funding has gone. Uh, you know, we've done a number of different projects. The uh, Sage Grouse project in Idaho has. Uh, uh, brought back a lot of benefit to us and, and very likely will be a, a key in some of the, the debates that we're going to be uh, involved in as we move forward to, here in the next couple of years. Um, I'm looking forward to seeing what the results are on uh, some of the ongoing work that we should be getting some reports back on here in the near future, uh, like for the non-fee costs, the things like that. Um, uh, we haven't been... Uh, seen that anybody's going to be looking at the fees and that for sure yet, but we do know that the conversation has been that all fees on federal lands are going to be looked at by this administration. So we, uh, we're we hopefully we're going to be uh, have some information and be ready to respond on some of that. Um, I'd like to take this moment to thank Bob for his uh, many years of service and, and the good job you've been doing here. Uh, thank everybody. Uh, uh, Mark, Brenda, everyone on the, the team, and especially a big thank you to our staff that has worked hard putting this program together and uh, getting this, this uh, uh, allowing us the opportunity to uh, at least communicate here, even though we haven't been able to, to get together and, and have a, a good face-to-face -face conversation and, and renew our friendships. Uh, we will be uh, uh, moving forward. Uh, we are uh, on track and uh, uh, planning on having face-to-face -face meeting in Oregon next fall in September. Uh, so we uh, plan on that and we're really looking forward to it. And as uh, the, uh, all the, everybody's meetings uh, get to uh, keying up here through the summer and into the fall, uh, please uh, get a hold of us. We're looking forward to getting out on the ground and uh, join you at your meetings and, and share the message and, and work together. So, uh, um, and uh, I'm uh, getting a little out of sync. I want to thank you, uh, uh, all the committee people that have uh, stepped up, volunteered to participate. And uh, please, uh, uh, you know, share the message that you've been hearing here. Let's uh, get the word out to people. And uh, the more people we can get involved in these committees, uh, the more effective we're going to be. Uh, the, our best representation is being able to uh, uh, Share your messages that you bring up to us because we, we can't see it all. We need you to tell us what's going on. So uh, with that, I will uh, thank you, everybody, and bring this meeting to a close. We'll see you this summer or in fall.